1976, Rush's 2112 released, and my dad was a freshman in high school. <laughs> I can see it. He and his friends listening to this record on repeat. They loved it because it's one of the best rock records of all time. Years later, him working at KFC and after hours or driving home, blasting 2112 and singing along. After that, his first office job and finding co-workers who also listened to Rush and listening to the record with them. As he grew even older, becoming the father of my brother and I, he would bounce us on his knee and listen to, you guessed it, 2112. My brother and I's first concerts ended up being Rush. Throughout all these moments in my father's life, this record has been there. He originally enjoyed it for how heavy the progressive metal was, but later grew to really appreciate the songwriting and world building found within the story of 2112. It's been entertainment, a social tool, a connection with his children, as well as a masterful work of art. Music latches on to memories, like photographs. If you ask someone why they love their favorite album, more often than not, they mention where they were when they listened to that album, rather than what specifically in the music makes that album good. Perhaps more than any art form, the entire moniker of what makes music good or bad is subjective. For my dad, listening to 2112 surely is an enjoyable experience because the music itself is so complex and skillfully performed. But moreover, it's a soundtrack for an entire life of memories. Rush certainly has done that for me too. I hear 2112 and I go back to when I constructed a band out of Legos and imagined they were playing the music. I remember having friends over in elementary school, playing the album and trying to explain what was so special about it. I remember my first Rush concert on the Time Machine tour and my last on the R40 tour. The experience of actually seeing this incredibly complex music performed live blew me away at a young age. Rush dominates my early childhood memories, but not my teens. My teen years are themed by car seat headrest. I've made a video about car seat headrest before on November 20th, 2016. I was 17 years old and coming out of a time in my life that found itself in union with that music. Particularly, it connected to this album, Twin Fantasy. I remember screaming lyrics as I drove home from school, and when I saw it live for the first time in a small venue in St. Louis with my friends, we were singing every word. We stood in the front row and forgot our troubles as we danced to songs like Bodies and Cute Thing. For a long time, this album guided my way through the rise of anxiety and the struggle of adolescence. I mention all of this because of the recently released new version of Twin Fantasy. The original came out in 2011, but due to a lack of resources, felt incomplete by frontman Will Toledo. Now that the band is behind Matador Records and has grown tremendously in popularity, the time felt right to return to this album, and do it right this time. In releasing a re-recording of the album, the band is retracing the steps of the past. The label's description of the album says, quote, It's been hard, stepping into the shoes of Will's teenage self walking back to painful places. There are lyrics he wouldn't write again, an especially sad song he regards as an albatross. But even as he carries the weight of that younger, wounded will, he moves forward, he grows. He revises, gently, the songs we love so much. In the album's final moments, in those apologies to future me's and you's, there is more forgiveness than fury. This intention is highlighted by not only the fresh coat of paint over the old songs, turning lo-fi bops into high-fidelity rock songs, but also in slight alterations to lyrics and their delivery. Words that were once screamed in Beach Life and Death are now delivered more calmly. Thoughts of who Will wanted to be like in the original are now changed to his modern-day role models, Frank Ocean and James Brown. Rather than monologue on the use of the word galvanistic, which has been completely removed from the song Nervous Young and Humans, Will reflects on his current situation as a touring musician, forging a disconnect between the Will who wrote the album and the Will recording it now. It feels beneficially disconnected from the emotions that originally inspired the album in that it allows those emotions to be viewed more unbiasedly, face to face if you will.
When the original album released, it was at a time when the name car seat headrest meant nothing more than a literal headrest in a car. I didn't discover car seat headrest until 2014, and coincidentally, like my dad with 2112, I was a freshman in high school. At that time in my life, I was coming to grips with the person I was becoming and how that person is different from who I was as a kid. The struggle of not knowing who I was inside or out caused me to be aggressive towards people and behave erratically. What helped with that struggle, however, was for someone to tell me in great detail that it's okay, that they're going through the same thing. That's what Twin Fantasy was. And when I listen to the re-release, it's those memories of struggle that I, like Will, return to. Twin Fantasy is ripe with foreground themes of depression, anxiety, and fantasizing. I've discussed this before in my original video on Car Seat Headrest, so I'll gloss over the how it does that now. Basically, anxiety and fantasy specifically match my experience with this record. These two emotions filled my high school life in an intense way, and are the reason my memories of Twin Fantasy are so vivid. You know, I used to talk a lot. You'd put the camera on me, and I would start doing something random to fill the space. I guess it all started to quiet down when I had my first real bouts of anxiety. See, I never used to have anxiety. It's something that happened starting in middle school. I guess life was disillusioned when I was one of the last of my friends to hit puberty. Looking back, it seems so dumb to be worried about that, but I was. I didn't know how to handle it. I saw no value in my life if I was somehow inferior to everyone else. I laid on the ground during my showers for extended periods of time. I texted manic anxieties to my friends. And, since music is emotion, I looked for music that related to how I felt. I started modifying song lyrics Puberty. to match my feelings of worrying about being a short, high-pitched kid. This was all before Car Seat Headrest. But I think the reason I was so attracted to that music was because I didn't have to modify the lyrics. They were real. As I grew, quite literally, out of height anxieties, they became more social. I had a bad falling out in the 8th grade with a good friend of mine, and I had to rethink my entire social life for a time. I couldn't really hang out with the people I had been with before. For the first time in my life, making new friends no longer came easy to me. I was in a perfect position for art to begin touching me on a personal level because I was disconnected with people, uh, forced to connect with myself. I eventually made up with that lost friend, and he actually introduced me to Car Seat Headrest. Because I hopped on the Car Seat Headrest train relatively early, it felt so personal. I used to interact on Twitter with Will all the time, and kind of felt like he was some kind of acquaintance. Social media is weird like that. I never really had a relationship like that with an artist before. I loved his music, and a part of that was because I felt like I knew him. It wasn't really until I started having my first real crushes on girls that Twin Fantasy spoke to me in a different way way, since it is, at its core, a love album. It stopped being the project of a friend and started being the tune to my life. Just like in the album, I fantasized and idealized someone I liked. When I hear songs like Stop Smoking and Sober to Death, I remember her. See, I was a pretty clean-cut kid in high school as far as drinking and smoking went. She wasn't, which doesn't really bother me now, but certainly did back then. I created this image of her in my mind, that if I was with her, I could mold her into a more positive way of living. That is, if I could even tell her how I felt. In the album, Will seems to give up on that front and just accept the person he likes, idealizing them in different ways, and I kinda did the same thing. What started as a pure fantasy became desperation just to be with someone, anyone. Things began being very bad at this point, so let me clarify that it came in occasional cycles. So before you start worrying about me, I'm fine now, and most of the time I lived normally back then.
I hear that lyric, it breaks my heart. I wish I could go back and console myself. I wanted so desperately not to be alone, and I felt very alone. Some of my friends were starting to be in relationships, which stacked jealousy and anxiety of being on the same tier as them on top of itself, and heightened any kind of negative feelings I had. One night, I was just so worked up over this that I didn't know what to do with myself. I was actually texting the girl I liked all these negative thoughts around this subject, which she handled like a pro. I kept saying, I don't want to be alone. I don't want to be alone. I don't want to be alone. Over and over. I, I didn't know what to do. So I just went downstairs and laid on the ground for like 10 minutes. I, I didn't know what to do. I, uh, I, it was, uh, The next day, I listened to that lyric over and over again. It was hope when I felt the most hopeless. In Bodies, when Will sings, and I know that I don't talk a lot, I remember latching onto that lyric because I wanted so badly to be who I really was on the inside, but anxiety made me perform to other people. It still does. I felt like my true self never talked, and it was always some mask. I didn't really want it to talk either, because when it did, it was sad and kind of a buzzkill. The more that true self was repressed, the more it snowballed into a general disposition of feeling worse and worse. I had this intense crush on this girl, and my fantasy of her, or anyone, was someone who would let me talk as my true self, as well as someone who I could fix. Which when she handled my little panic attacks so well, made me like her more. It got to the point where I was sick of meaning and I just wanted to embrace her, hold her as Will sang. I wanted to throw caution to the wind and live in a moment with someone. When I listen to the new version of Bodies, this memory of a fake experience pervades thought. Holding someone who doesn't exist. About a year later, I entered a real relationship, and once again, twin fantasy changed for me. When you spend about a year and a half imagining what a relationship is like, when you actually enter one, you realize it is totally different. Twin Fantasy was trying to tell me this all along by comparing the fantasy of who this love could be with the reality of it. But I was so wrapped up in the first act that I ignored the second. Songs like Cute Thing or Famous Prophets really exemplify this. The anxiety early on of wanting to get the words right when you talk to her, taking on her problems and trying to help in the best way you can, doing things way out of your comfort zone, and when it's all over, having it be a complex situation of emotional dissatisfaction, wanting to go back, and sadness over the way things ended up. All of this was present in the arc of my first relationship. I hear these two songs, and instead of fake thoughts, the memories are real. It's memories not of all the positive aspects of that relationship, of which there are many, but rather what ended it, what made it difficult. If fantasizing was the mistake Will made on Twin Fantasy, then I did the same thing. I idealized a version I created of her, and thankfully I realized how harmful that is. I had these ideas in my head of what the situation could be like, so I could never enjoy what it was. Around this time, slightly before, I made my video on Car Seat Headrest. I was just trying to say that I connected to Twin Fantasy more because of its specificity to real moments in my life as I was living it. Moments I hadn't experienced with Teens of Denial. I don't think I was ready to say that though. <laughs> When I see the memories that this album calls to mind, I don't really feel sad. I know some of these memories are depressing. My heart breaks thinking of how bottled up I was, how worried I was about being like everyone else. I empathize with that person I was. I still have some of those problems today. And yet, being only a year removed from it, I can't help but feel like a lot has changed. Maybe I'm crazy, but in transitioning from high school to college, from a repressive environment to an expressive one, as well as pursuing more self-betterment, I don't think I am the same person who I was when I listened to Twin Fantasy. 
This remake has come at exactly the right time, since I'm in a place physically and emotionally where I can critically look at the person I used to be in the same way Will does. The renaming of the original to Mirror to Mirror and the new as Face to Face is brilliant. When I was in that situation, I couldn't really get out until I literally went to school in another city. Everything had to change. It felt like a bunch of mirrors looking at the same thing. It was an endless cycle of anxiety, idealization, and sadness going round and round and round. Now that everything's different, I can look at it and find out its form. I'm ready to view it face to face. I'm ready to say that I was sad and that I took that out on other people. If I may, I think this applies to Will as well. Now that he's removed from the time and place that produced twin fantasy, I think he probably feels the same thing I do about my past. He can view it for how it is, how he felt and acted. He can judge it properly. When I released my first video on Car Seat Headrest, Will saw it and hated it. He blocked me on Twitter and I've been told he said, how can someone put this much effort into being so dense, harsh? I didn't really plan for this reaction from him. When I made that video, I thought he'd appreciate how I dissected Twin Fantasy and praised it. I see now that what I missed was that it was all personal. My interpretations of these songs is personal, my experience is personal, and the emotions tied to them are personal. Like a lot of people in my life, I idealized Will and his music to be this monolithic theme to all struggling adolescent people. But I don't regret the video. Because Will received it so poorly, the seeds were planted for me to re-examine it, and at that time, I didn't realize that the music was such a part of my life. If I hadn't gone through that struggle, I don't think I would be where I am today. At the same time I was making reductive statements on examining music, I was growing passionate for art in its ability to free what we bottle up. Twin Fantasy has a way of staying with me because of the experiences I just described and how it connects to them. I know a lot of what I've said may be too much information or alternatively may be pretty common. I'm not making this for sympathy. I know it could be a lot worse. I'm making this because it's incredibly difficult to share personal experiences with emotional issues to look at yourself face to face and judge toxic behavior. Even harder to do this publicly. And yet, Will Toledo consistently does this with his music. And it has helped me and so many other people. I may not ever know what the objective meaning of Twin Fantasy is, but I know that it's gonna mean something different every time I return.